What's that? Oh, let's start with a joke. Um, okay. A lot of people ask me why I wear the mask. And uh, I say like, oh, it's so I can be a symbol and you know, but really it's just that I can look down at my teleprompter and no one knows that I'm doing it. <sighs> so, yeah. You wanna know who my favorite superhero is? Green Arrow. I'm just kidding. It's Spider-Man, obviously. And you wanna know the one thing that's always fascinated me about Spider-Man? His superpowers aren't all that super. Now by that, I don't mean he never does things that ordinary people couldn't do. I mean, throughout his fictional appearances, we've seen him jump off of buildings unscathed. Full of the exaggerated swagger of a black teen. We've seen him sustain injuries that could easily kill the average person. And we've seen him maintain actual personal relationships despite having way too much going on in his life. Not to mention the number of times his secret identity should have been revealed but somehow wasn't. No, no, no. What I mean to say is if you take each of his powers at face value and you evaluate its physical improbability, none of them really hold a candle to some of the other soups out there. I mean, web shooting? It's just a simple liquid to solid transition. There's tons of real physical or chemical reactions that could create these same effects. Wall crawling? We've had engineers help humans climb even the smoothest walls for a while. And some humans don't even need the help. Super agility? I mean, have you seen what Simone Biles has been up to? Never mind the millions of gymnasts and tracers around the globe who repeatedly recreate Spidey's moves. A quick disclaimer, some of them get seriously injured. Or worse. Super strength? Obviously, the strength Spidey demonstrates is simply unachievable, but there are some pretty strong people out there. Not to mention that exoskeleton innovation is continuously improving. Now, Spidey sense is really a question mark, but given that it's not ever super well defined, you could draw a comparison to night vision or even simple motion detectors. And this is different from superheroes like Batman or Iron Man, who are supposed to be simply human, but still appear to be superhuman in some circumstances. And this is different from heroes like Captain America and Black Panther, whose only real superpower is super strength, and it's really not well defined in fiction if they are superhuman or just peak human. No, Spidey is unique. His superpowers are actually superpowers. He's got stuff coming out of his hands, and a theme song. The whole shebang. But it's not at the level of, I don't know, super speed, shooting lasers out of your eyes, or manipulating probabilities or whatever. His superpowers are a bit, I, I don't know, I don't want to say mundane, but just nowhere near as godlike as some of the other superheroes. And you wonder why this is, you know, it sort of contributes to the relatability of the character. If you look at the context of a lot of the other characters out there, Peter Parker and Miles Morales aren't so much superhumans as they are secretly above average at a few things. And I like to think we all feel like we have our thing that we can do that other people don't know about, and then one day we just drop it on them like, guess what, mother I make a mean chocolate cake and it's really impressive. Yeah, it's like that. I mean, Spider-Man is basically like a quarantine mom making sourdough, except he doesn't tell absolutely everybody about it. Now wait a minute, let me zero in on one of those powers I mentioned earlier. Yeah, web shooters. What did I say about that? It's just a simple liquid to solid transition. There's tons of real physical or chemical reactions that could create these same effects. Now hold on. Is it really that simple? I feel like I'll need my lab coat for this. Ah, alright, that's better. Now, of course, there are tons of real physical or chemical reactions that could create the effect of web shooters. I mean, nylon synthesis, melt-blown thermoplastic, solvent evaporation, to name a few. But which one is best? You guys can't tell, but I'm, I'm raising one of my eyebrows. Now, I would say, as far as what we've seen in Spider-Man fiction, web shooters have two basic uses, which I like to call grappling and catching. Now at this point, you might be asking, 
Excuse me, Mr. Amazing, but what about a web shooter that doesn't use fluid? What about a simple grappling gun mounted on the wrist? To which I say, get the hell out of here. No, I'm just kidding. You can stay. For now. It's true. These web shooters, which I call solid line web shooters, are also a viable option, and many people have actually tried making them, including yours truly. These basically just consist of a simple projectile propulsion mechanism, whether it be electromagnetic or pressurized gas powered or explosive propellant powered or just spring powered with some sort of line attached. These are generally advantageous for the range they can achieve and the high tension a pre-manufactured solid line can sustain, especially if you're using something like Kevlar. In case it wasn't obvious, these web shooters are pretty much good for grappling only, unless you're including net guns in this category, which are obviously for catching but I haven't seen a wrist-mounted version. Actually, that's a good idea. I better write that down. And even when grappling, once you shoot your projectile, it's shot. What do you do then? Oh, you want to shoot another one? Tough. You forgot to design a real system or a cartridge system, and now you're falling from the sky. Now, <laughs> I've done both reels and cartridges, and I will say it's still a huge delay between shots. This is partly why I designed my conveyor belt web shooter, which is more of a proof of concept than anything else at the moment. And another thing I feel like no one brings up, not even me, is I can't hold on to this tiny line. And yes, I'm calling this tiny, you'll see why later. And if I make it any bigger, I can't store it at all. But apart from that, the main thing is that these solid line web shooters don't show the versatility we'd expect from Spidey's web shooters in fiction. That's why this video will focus on fluid web shooters from here on out. Now, while fluid web shooters have not shown the same capability for grappling as solid line web shooters have shown, the truth is the technology is closer than it's ever been. And it gets closer all the time. I mean, sure, this line is pretty weak, but it's an achievement in and of itself to just make a line out of liquid instantaneously. The fact is, fluid web shooters have the potential to be good at both grappling and catching. Now, in the vast majority of cases, a fluid web shooter will be utilizing the chemistry of polymers. Due to these specific class of chemicals relative strength and unique ability to melt and dissolve, or even the polymerization reaction itself. Now, there might be a reason for this. Spider silk in nature is technically a polymer, Polymers are long chains of molecules, and due to weaker secondary bonds between the chains, they can tangle and shape themselves to reach very specific structures, leading to very specific properties. Spider silk has the insane tensile strength and elasticity it has, not because of the amino acids in the peptide chain, but because the hydrogen bonds in the chain cause segments of the protein to form helices and spirals, leading to elasticity, and very crystalline ordered sheets, leading to strength. Now, while nature has had millions of years to evolve the structure of spider silk and make it one of the best performing materials in existence, we've had just under 60 years since Spidey came into existence to imagine a real life web fluid. So you know what, just, just cut me some slack, okay? I mean, nature had a head start. The benefit of even having the opportunity to alter properties of the fluid using chemistry cannot be understated. This means that there are potentially limitless web fluids, as opposed to choosing between a Kevlar and a polyester line at the hardware store. Oftentimes, the concept of a polymer blend may be of use. This is similar to the concept of alloying in metals to increase strength, but also to alter other properties. Mixing different polymers together may give the resulting line unique properties. Science aside, let's face it, we're all drawn to the idea of a fluid web shooter a hell of a lot more than the line web shooters. That's because it's the method actually used by Spidey in fiction. He's always talking about web fluid this, web fluid that. That mystery of how the liquid suddenly forms into a strong solid line is a fascinating question for all of us. And that's a mystery we can solve together. So let's lay out the key aspects that web shooters need to achieve. A liquid to solid transition, high velocity, and an adhesive cohesive balance. Let's start with the liquid to solid transition. We've already touched on this a bit. Web shooters don't run on diesel. This transition requires that some liquid source, easily stored and easily dispensed, turns into a solid material at the nozzle of the web shooter. If you classify the web shooter into two domains, you essentially have the inside and the outside. Such that we can say, the substance within the inside domain must be a liquid, and the substance within the outside domain must be a solid. So we can think about the different environmental properties in these domains that can make this possible. For instance, pressure, temperature, mixing states, or rheological effects. Many web shooters have utilized pressure as a useful property to differentiate between liquid and solid forms of a material, primarily through dissolution and evaporation. Many of the web shooters I presented on my channel, as well as the famous Silly String toy, use this effect. With a pressure-driven evaporation solidification process, a propellant is used that can exist in more than one phase at the ambient temperature of operation. When it is pressurized within the inside domain, it is what is known as a saturated liquid-vapor mixture. Some of it is liquid, and some of it is vapor. 
When both of these phases are present, the vapor exerts a constant pressure, known as the vapor pressure, no matter what the quality or how much of each phase is present. The exertion of the vapor pressure is what allows the substance to be a propellant. The propellant exists purely as a vapor in the outside domain, when both the temperature and pressure are ambient. If some of the substance within the inside domain is able to escape to the outside domain, some of the liquid phase on the inside domain will evaporate to mix with the vapor phase, maintaining a constant vapor pressure for the inside domain. The solidification comes into play when the propellant also acts as a solvent in its liquid phase. It dissolves the other ingredients within the web shooter. To put that simply, if one of the other ingredients is a polymer, then bing bang boom, as soon as that liquid solution reaches the outside domain, then bing bang boom, that vapor evaporates away, and you're left with a big ol' solid polymer, hopefully with web-like properties. This is the method that I and others have used for the most part in the last several years, with the fluid usually involving the solvent propellant, tetrafluoroethane, and the polymer, polymethyl methacrylate. You can check many, many tutorials for that stuff on my channel, but people still ask. Temperature is a property I've seen applied in two basic ways, both of which also require phase transitions. The first way is still evaporation, only this time it's temperature driven. Say you still have that liquid solution of a polymer on the inside domain, except the solvent is no longer a propellant, it can only exist in its liquid phase at ambient temperature. If you don't add some sort of temperature change to the outside domain, then that solvent is never going to evaporate and you're just going to end up with a weird squirt gun. But if you're able to heat the outside domain above the solvent's boiling point, then that solid polymer is going to be left behind in all its web-like glory. Now, when comparing the two methods of evaporation, they each have their advantages and disadvantages. Firstly, propellant evaporation is passive. It requires no power source. It's simply a system trying to reach equilibrium. The heated evaporation, well, <laughs> that heat has to come from somewhere. Whether it be resistance heating, a heat pump, a gasoline engine, something that actively introduces energy into the system. On the other hand, propellants that have required properties are almost overwhelmingly volatile organic compounds that are harmful to the environment or to the human body. There are a few chemicals where you can skirt around the environmental issue, but it's still an issue. With heated evaporation, your solvent could be arguably anything, as everything has a boiling point. It could be water, for instance, which is pretty much harmless, and there are water-soluble polymers. Now, apart from evaporation, temperature can be employed in another way that I haven't seen until recently. In this case, the liquid to solid transition is a process many of us are already familiar with. Freezing. Not as in like involving ice, as in the opposite of melting. So you have a polymer that's solid at room temperature. How do you store it as a liquid? You melt it down and store it at high temperature. Thus the outside domain being colder allows the web fluid to solidify. This is something I've only seen from a channel called Joel Creates with his hot glue web shooter. However, I can only imagine the amount of power that is required to store a whole tank of molten thermoplastic. And I left a comment asking Joel if this is a problem, but he didn't reply. Now, what about mixing? This generally involves chemical polymerization reactions, which is the forming of bonds between molecules to form polymer chains. Two chemicals mixing can usually be enough to introduce this reaction, though some happen quicker than others. I mean, I love quick curing epoxy as much as the next guy, but five minutes for a web shooter to become a web is enough time for the lizard to bite your head off. I want to add a disclaimer here, as I am about to talk about dangerous chemicals, so please don't close the video after I mention something cool and go try it yourself. You might end up severely hurt in the most horrible ways if you don't take the proper precautions. A quicker polymerization that a lot of people have brought to my attention, and yes guys, I am aware of it, and if I see it in my comments again, I swear I will just... Yes, I am talking about nylon synthesis. Now, nylon is one of the strongest polymers out there, and it's usually synthesized with two chemicals mixing. One is adipoyl chloride and one is hexamethylene diamine. Gosh, that's a mouthful. These two chemicals are commonly positioned at different layers in a container, with the boundary between them forming nylon, which is continually drawn or spun out of the solution and collected as a fiber. So these chemicals aren't some that you would mix like you would epoxy, but I would be interested to see what would happen if you synthesize nylon through a static mixer. What would come out the other end? This definitely has to be tested in a proper laboratory because both adipoyl chloride and hexamethylene diamine are dangerous as shit, pardon my French. I'm talking serious burns and severe irritation dangerous as French, and that's not something I think anybody wants. So if you're not a chemist with adequate protection and ventilation like this dude, 
don't experiment with this and definitely don't go shooting dangerous chemicals at high velocities and definitely don't do it in public. Other fast methods of chemical solidification don't seem to be so much polymerization reactions as they are cross-linking reactions, where polymer chains already exist, but they are in liquid form, either in solution or they just exist in a liquid state at room temperature. Examples include the classic slime experiment, where borax is added to polyvinyl acetate glue and the polymer chains are cross-linked. Recently, another spidery inventor, the human spider and I, looked into a process that is used to make artificial caviar, called spherification. This involves introducing an aqueous solution of sodium alginate to calcium ions, which replace the sodium ions, creating bonds between alginate chains. Keep in mind these cross-linking bonds are not covalent, so they are easier to break, and they are easier to break than the covalent bonds in epoxy or nylon. All of these chemical mixing procedures now require an additional domain for the web shooter. The outside is the same, but you now require two insides if you want to call them A and B, where the two parts that need to be mixed are kept separately. Only just before they reach the outside should the contents of A and B be mixed, so that the web shooter doesn't clog up with polymerized or cross-linked material. Now this is obviously a disadvantage, as it requires additional hardware, two canisters, two valves, and possibly more, making for a bigger web shooter. That brings us to real-logical effects, which can be interesting, but the web spinning applications presented here are highly theoretical. Now, rheology is the study of the flow of matter, but the term is usually applied to fluid studies. This includes concepts like viscosity, which we colloquially describe as a liquid being thicker or thinner. Viscosity is a constant for what are known as Newtonian fluids, because they follow Newton's law of viscosity. That viscosity is the ratio of the shear stress applied to, on a fluid to the amount that its velocity changes over the direction perpendicular to the velocity, which basically tells you how much the fluid is responding to the applied stress. If the velocity changes a lot as a result of the applied stress, then the fluid has low viscosity. If you're trying to get liquid to flow or stir and you're applying a lot of stress but nothing much is happening, then the fluid by both mathematical and logical reasoning has a high viscosity. Viscosity can also be understood as the internal friction of a fluid, when the molecules have a hard time slipping past each other. Only some fluids are actually truly Newtonian, like water for instance, but most can be approximated as such. For non-Newtonian fluids whose mathematical laws I won't go over here, viscosity is not constant. Either the viscosity increases when more stress is applied, or it decreases when more stress is applied. These two basic types of non-Newtonian fluids are called shear thickening and shear thinning fluids respectively, for both the type of stress that the fluids experience and for the effect that the stress has on the viscosity. Some shear thickening fluids exhibit this property so dramatically such that they act as a solid when external forces are applied to the surface of the fluid, like with the classic mixture of corn starch and water. The opposite effect can be described for shear thinning fluids like ketchup, when the fluid won't even budge until some sort of external stress is applied, like tapping or, or shaking. Of course, you could never really tell how solid the fluid is within the container when no stress is applied, as measuring that would, would require applying some kind of stress. So that's interesting. So basically, the two domains of the web shooter, the inside and the outside, could be characterized by the type of stress the fluid is experiencing. And you want the web fluid to act liquid on the inside and to act solid on the outside. Now, I've done this briefly many years ago with a safe shear thinning fluid composed of xanthan gum and water that was able to shoot out as if it were water, but was also able to adhere to the side of a surface without dripping all the way to the bottom, as if it had solidified. Now, of course, it's easy to doubt the practical applications of something like that, but the only alternative at this point is shear thickening fluid, and you couldn't build a web out of that because it's probably going to be liquid when stationary, and you couldn't shoot it out as the shear stress applied to the fluid during propulsion would solidify it before it even left the shooter. So neither is really something that you want to take with you when you're crime fighting. But just imagine for a second, a fluid that acts solid when tensile stress is applied, as opposed to shear stress. Now, I'm not really an expert in this area, but I know this is a very strange idea, as I've never heard of fluids experiencing tensile stress, as the molecules only have trouble sliding past each other, they aren't really difficult to separate from one another. That's like solid stick. But if it were possible, it could potentially be something that you could hang from and shoot out of a nozzle. Basically, you need some type of matter that doesn't really exist, a fluid that basically acts as though it knows exactly what you want it to do. So finally, we have our sort of insane multi-dimensional pro and con list for liquid to solid transition approaches. Now, as you can see, there are more cons than pros in all approaches, but I don't know, maybe I just designed it like that to make a point. I guess I'm a pessimist. 
Well, let me know in the comments if you think one of these cons isn't actually a big deal, and maybe I'll turn my mood around. Also, please let me know if there's an approach that you think has not been covered here, and I'll be sure to check it out and discuss it in a future video. So once we've conquered the liquid to solid transition, are we done? Of course not, you dummy. We've never really seen Spidey just just ooze, like, like ooze some goo out of his wrists, right? I mean, it's a web shooter, not a web dispenser or a web spinner even. And that makes everything much more complicated. We've already discussed briefly the production of nylon where the polymer created is very, very strong, but has to be manually pulled from the chemical bath and wound around a spool as a fiber. This method of synthesis would not work for web shooters. Actually, this is a very common production method for materials like this, Oftentimes, a special dye called a spinneret, crazy, yes, I know, like a spider, wow, is used to force whatever solution is being used through tiny holes to create the fiber. And a variety of methods are used to solidify it. But this is a very, very, very slow process, not really the behavior we want. The same thing goes for the deposition of viscous fluids that are intended to cure, usually into elastomers, which is just a fancy name for stretchy polymers like silicone or polyurethane. An example of this is the silicone caulk that you would use to seal in your shower or bathtub. The properties of this material are decent and could be considered web-like, but with a viscosity that high, there's no way you'll ever shoot that to a range of more than a couple inches, let alone across a room. Now, range and exit velocity are related in a very simple way. If you've ever taken a physics class, you would know this. Any massive projectile under the influence of gravity, whether it be a ball or a feather or a particle of web fluid, follows a parabolic trajectory. Assuming there are no other forces present, like drag or surface tension, which are good assumptions for small, solid objects. Now, when we look at the definitely spherical Earth very closely, the ground looks flat. And that's the sort of range we're most likely going to be using web shooters in, unless you get some sort of cosmic web shooter. Gravity will always act towards the center of the Earth, which in the scale is a direction that presents itself as always downward. Our coordinate system directions, X and Y, will be used to differentiate between the horizontal and vertical directions. Since gravity only acts downward, it will only affect the vertical velocity of the projectile, accelerating it towards the ground. The horizontal velocity remains constant, and the parabolic trajectory results. The range is usually measured as the horizontal coordinate at which the projectile's vertical coordinate is zero, or when it hits the ground. The x-axis intercept, if you want to call it that. If you're finding the projectile horizontally, you can find the range by first finding the time it takes for the ball to hit the ground, which is only dependent on the initial y component of velocity and the gravitational acceleration and the height at which it is thrown. Then you will find how far the ball will be able to go horizontally during this amount of time which you can find by multiplying the horizontal component of the velocity by the time to impact. From the simulation you see here, we can gather that there are many ways to increase the range of a projectile by either increasing the vertical height at which it was launched or increasing the exit angle, but we don't always have unlimited height and the angle increase only helps up to a certain point until the projectile motion becomes more like an upward throw. What we can see is that increasing the exit velocity is always beneficial to the range. Of course, we won't always be aiming our web shooters at ground targets, actually almost never. And we would much rather hit the thing we're pointing at, right? I mean, as hard as gravity makes that. So a much more realistic way to evaluate the range would be to define a tolerance for how far away the projectile hits its intended target, which is something that the exit angle defines. Oh yeah, we are sharpshooters, baby. A target allowance, if you want to call it that. Increasing the target allowance increases the range, but decreasing it means you have to be more precise and the range decreases. Here we see that the range is much less than it would be should we want it to hit the ground. So we clearly have to add a lot more exit velocity for the projectile to shoot somewhat straight, which makes intuitive sense, but is supported by the math. Stay in school, kids. So long story short, exit velocity isn't just about speed. It actually will define how far your web shooter will be able to shoot. As for the extrapolation of projectile motion to something like a fluid stream, let's just take a look at this experiment. I'd say that liquid looks, ooh, pretty parabolic to me. So how can we increase our exit velocity? Well, now we're getting into classical fluid dynamics. Let's start with the introduction of what we call an ideal fluid, which is incompressible and inviscid, or has no viscosity, and whose flow is always irrotational, i.e. there's no turbulence. If we look at ideal fluid flow through any geometry, we know a couple of things for certain. 
If the flow is steady, that is, the velocity and other quantities don't change with time, the incompressibility of the fluid tells us that the flow rate at the inlet is the same as the flow rate at the outlet. This is called a continuity, and it can be seen that a constant volumetric flow rate means faster velocities for smaller pipe diameters. So one way to increase our exit velocity would be to decrease the diameter of our nozzle. But we will soon see why this is not always the best way. Now, Bernoulli's principle also comes into play with ideal fluids. For those who are unaware, Bernoulli's principle brings the universal law of energy conservation into fluid dynamics. When any system in the whole universe undergoes a process, the amount of energy at the end of the process must be equal to the amount of energy at the beginning of the process, plus the amount of energy transferred to the system, and minus the amount of energy taken out of the system. The same applies to fluid dynamics. At the inlet, the fluid has a certain kinetic energy equal to its mass times its velocity squared, and a certain gravitational potential energy equal to its mass times its altitude times the gravitational acceleration. At the outlet, the fluid might have a different kinetic energy and a different potential energy, but if no energy is added to the system, or in other words, if no work is done on the system, the total inlet and total outlet energy should equal each other. So how do we do work on a fluid system? You may have learned in physics class that work is doing a force over a certain distance, for instance, if you want to push a block over a flat surface with ordinary Coulomb friction. At the beginning, the block is stationary and at an altitude, and at the end, the block is stationary and at the same altitude. So the total energy in the system did not change. So the net work done on the system is zero. However, we know that kinetic friction was acting on the object throughout the entire distance, opposite to the direction of motion, at a constant value of the normal force the surface exerts on the block multiplied by the coefficient of friction. Since frictional force acts opposite to the direction of motion, the friction is doing negative work on the system. So to keep the net work zero, I must be doing positive work on the system, equal to the sum of each little movement I did multiplied by the force I was exerting through that little movement. You'll probably recognize this, if you've taken calculus or physics, as the integral of a force along a path with respect to the amount of distance traveled, or the integral from the beginning of the path to the end of the path of f dot dl. If f is constant as it is in the block example, this simplifies to simply f times l, where l is the length of the path and f is the constant exerted force, but the integral is far more powerful in both usage and understanding. So back to our fluid system, how do we do work on it? I want you to first imagine a piston trying to compress a fluid. Now assuming no friction in the piston, the pressure in the chamber will be exactly counteracting the force exerted on the piston. That is to say, F equals PA. But the force and pressure are not constant, they may be functions of the distance traveled, i.e. F as a function of L is equal to P as a function of L times A. Imagine the piston moves a really small amount. We know that the area is equal to the little bit of volume that is taken by the piston dv divided by the little bit of distance that the piston moved, dl. If we multiply both sides by dl, we end up with this. And this should start looking familiar. The work done by the piston can be seen by integrating both sides as the integral over a volumetric change process of the pressure throughout the process. The units of force times distance are also equivalent to the units of pressure times volume. So back to Bernoulli's equation, where we were trying to figure out how to represent work done on a fluid in flow. Essentially what we saw in the piston example is that pressure changes can do work on a flow. So adding a pressure difference to the inlet side multiplied by volume gives us the work done on the system. And the outlet energy should be higher if the term is positive, i.e. the pressure at the inlet is more than the pressure at the outlet, which makes intuitive sense. Now, some of these terms still look a bit weird. I mean, mass of the fluid doesn't really make sense as the fluid is continuous, and the same goes for volume. It is only after we divide by volume and see the true nature of Bernoulli's equation. I mean, it's incredible how perfectly this principle is intended for fluids, as density becomes a representation of how massive a fluid is in order to calculate kinetic energy. Looking at Bernoulli's equation, we can disregard some terms when it comes to web shooter. The mass and the height difference of the fluid at the inlet and the outlet are not really going to justify looking at a difference in potential energy, as the most height difference you can get is just like the length of a human arm. So we're just left with comparing the velocity at the inlet and the outlet with the pressure difference between the inlet and the outlet. In order to have a higher outlet velocity, we need to have a higher difference in pressure between the inlet and the outlet, with the inlet pressure being higher. 
This also makes intuitive sense. I hope. So for an ideal fluid, we can decrease our nozzle size and increase our pressure difference to get a higher velocity. But remember, this is when ignoring a fluid's compressibility, viscosity, and turbulence. It turns out that assuming incompressibility is more than sufficient when modeling liquids, which applies to web fluid, even if there may be some gas bubbles from the vapor phase of the propellant, which could allow it to compress a small amount. Turbulence and viscosity, however, are sort of mutually exclusive. You'll often see highly viscous fluids like honey acting without any apparent turbulence, behavior we call laminar. On the contrary, you'll see very low viscosity fluids like air having a whole lot of turbulence. One way to quantify this is using something called the Reynolds number, which has no units, but is simply a ratio between inertial forces increased by quantities like mass and velocity, or in the fluid case, density and velocity, and viscous forces increased by viscosity and decreased by the scale of the flow. The L in the Reynolds number equation here is a measure of the scale of the flow and is called the characteristic length. For pipe flow, this can be chosen as the diameter of the pipe, called the hydraulic diameter. If the Reynolds number is high, above about 50,000, the flow is likely turbulent, but also easier to approximate as inviscid. If the Reynolds number is low, below about 2300, the flow is likely laminar, but also likely requires viscous effects to be taken into account when modeling. Remember viscosity is like friction in the fluid. So we can expect it to do negative work on the flow, just like the Coulomb friction did in our block example. In the ideal fluid, the only way to change the velocity and as a result the pressure from inlet to outlet is by changing the cross-sectional area of the pipe. But with viscous effects for a non-ideal fluid, we can expect a pressure drop across the length of a constant diameter pipe. This is called fully developed flow, or Poiseuil flow in a pipe, named after Jean Poiseuil. The derivation of fully developed pipe flow comes from the Navier-Stokes equations, which is a system of partial differential equations that can describe many, many fluid flows in three dimensions, but due to its nature, can't be solved by hand in most cases. Simulation softwares utilize numerical methods to solve these equations and compute how fluid might flow in a geometry due to certain boundary conditions. The Navier-Stokes equations defined in Cartesian coordinates are shown here. We have the continuity equation, which describes the compressibility of the fluid, and the three momentum equations, which are basically Newton's second law in fancy form. That the net force at some location in the flow equals the mass times the acceleration at that location in the flow for three orthogonal coordinates. Navier-Stokes equations are also defined in cylindrical coordinates instead of x, y, and z, where location is defined as a distance r away from a center axis a distance z along the center axis, and an angle theta away from some reference point. Fully developed flow means what its name sort of suggests, that it's been flowing through a pipe long enough that it no longer changes with time. That is to say, it's a steady flow, it no longer changes with time, and it no longer changes along the axial direction. So all the dt's and dz's can be set to zero. And since the flow is incompressible, we set this value, called the divergence of the velocity field, to zero. You can think of this as saying all the velocity vectors must be part of streamlines that converge to the outlet to preserve a steady mass flow. And for fully developed flow in a circular pipe, we don't expect there to be any changes in the angular direction, so all the d thetas can be set to zero. Suddenly, we're just left with derivatives with respect to one variable r, the radial direction. We now have an ordinary differential equation instead of a partial differential equation. Basically, what we're looking for here is how the velocity of the flow changes as you get farther from the center and closer to the walls, or the function u of r. Yes, u is velocity. I know, that's just a convention. Solving the differential equation for this gives us a distinctive parabolic velocity profile. Integrating over the whole cross-sectional area of the pipe and dividing by the area gives us an equation for the average velocity of the fluid, a version of an equation called the Hagen-Poiseuil equation, which describes Poiseuil flow through a circular pipe. Looking at this equation gives us things that we can change to improve the velocity at the outlet. We can either increase the pressure difference or size of the pipe, or decrease the length of the pipe or the viscosity of the fluid. This is something that's easily imaginable and even testable in the real world. So what tools do we have available to us? Increasing the pressure difference, essentially increasing the force on the fluid, seems like a surefire way to increase velocity, right? It turns out that tool isn't always available to us. For instance, oftentimes a propellant in a web shooter will exert a constant pressure on the inlet of the system at the exit point of the fluid reservoir or canister. 
This means that the pressure difference between the vapor pressure of the propellant and atmospheric pressure at the outlet cannot be altered. What about the diameter? Now, increasing it may actually lower the velocity, especially if you're just using it at the nozzle to direct the fluid. I mean, remember continuity. The diameter could be small enough such that it's restricting the flow velocity through viscous effects, but if it's too large, the volumetric flow rate will be unhindered by viscous effects, but the large cross-sectional area will lead to a low flow velocity, and you'll just end up oozing goo, as presented earlier. I would try to increase the diameter before the nozzle, though, and keep as much space as possible for the fluid to flow. The length of the pipe could be minimized for sure, but some people like myself prefer web shooters where the canister is somewhat removed from the valve for aesthetic purposes. Obviously, reducing viscosity is important, and that's why many of us opt for a more diluted web fluid. But if we were unhindered by that, we could have a higher polymer concentration and potentially stronger webs. But are these all the options we have? I mean, let's take a look back at the Hagen-Poiseuille equation. Remember that this equation only describes fully developed fluid flow through a circular pipe, and it does so through the viscosity or friction, the pressure difference, or the input force, and the geometry of the flow. Cylindrical pipes are just one of many flow geometries, and there's one critical part of the web shooter that will almost certainly not have a cylindrical flow, and that is the valve. Now, valves generally have complicated geometry, like this solenoid valve, which I used to use for web shooters years ago. One of the only valves that has cylindrical geometry when it is open is a ball valve, and those are generally not fast acting and require a lot of force to open, so not a good fit for a web shooter. Now, over the last few years, the human spider and I have been hard at work developing valves that are specifically designed for web shooters essentially trying to minimize dead zones where fluid has low or zero velocity and could solidify without leaving the nozzle, and trying to minimize the friction of the flow by improving the geometry. I mean, it's not easy by any means whatsoever to analytically model non-cylindrical flow geometry, especially if it has a changing cross-section. Usually, computational fluid dynamic simulations are used, where a computer solves the Navier-Stokes equations mentioned before. Using this, we can quantitatively compare a few different valve geometries. Remember this valve, the one I used that you were all so impressed by? Its basic design can be attributed to the human spider, and it seems to work very well. However, I never knew what it was like inside, so I decided to precisely measure each component and model the assembly in the computer. Once I did that, I can clearly see that there's limited space for the flow, so it could be constricted that and there are these bumpy areas from the threads on the brass pieces which lead to dead zones but also to more friction due to an equivalent pipe roughness, another factor in non-ideal fluid flow. Here is a simulation geometry equal to that of my web shooter. It includes the long tube leading from the canister to the valve, it includes the valve itself all the way to the nozzle of the web shooter. We will model a steady flow in the open position of the valve, so we are not taking a look at what we call transient effects, basically the acceleration of the fluid. We're only evaluating the maximum steady state velocity of the web fluid. Now I'll give this simulation a boundary condition of a pressure drop of about 564 kilopascals, which is 665 kilopascals, the vapor pressure of tetrafluoroethane, my current propellant, minus 101 kilopascals, atmospheric pressure. After the Navier-Stokes equations are solved in the simulator, we have a velocity field, which gives the velocity components u, v, and w in three respective coordinate directions, x, y, and z, at discrete points throughout the geometry. Here we can see the magnitude of the velocity. Because we want to evaluate the exit velocity of the web shooter, we will take a look at the discrete points very close to the outlet. Here we have these discrete points plotted as the x and y position that the velocity is occurring at and the z component of the velocity w. Here we can make a hypothesis that the flow at the outlet of the circular nozzle has a fully developed parabolic velocity profile. If this is the case, we should be able to fit this surface function to these points. We can convert from cylindrical coordinates to the Cartesian coordinates our points are plotted in by substituting x squared plus y squared for r squared. It looks like this surface fits the points fairly well, so it's safe to say we have a supported hypothesis. This gives us values for both the fraction delta p divided by 4 mu l and the radius r, and these can be used to find an estimation for the maximum flow velocity at the output, and the average flow velocity, which is just half of that. An argument can be made to use either of these as the speed of our web line, 
From here on out, we're going to be using the maximum velocity because on this channel, we like to oversell the success of our inventions, but I'll still show the graphs for both maximum and average velocity. So for the original valve geometry, we can see the maximum outlet velocity reaches about 12.9 meters per second. According to our range calculator, when firing horizontally, the fluid will hit the ground a little over seven meters away, and it'll be able to hit a target a meter in diameter about four meters away. So let's see what we can do to improve the inner geometry of our valve to decrease friction and hopefully allow a higher outlet velocity. Looking at some simple modifications like smoothing out the threads by either making the inner chamber thinner or wider shows that making it wider yields a slightly better result, but only when the spring is removed. In the case of the original valve, removing the spring from the geometry actually decreased the output velocity slightly, which did not support a hypothesis I had had that the spring increased friction with the fluid. However, doing the same for both smoother versions did support this hypothesis. The increase is so small that it appears that the string and geometry makes little difference. All of these different geometries did little to improve the valve friction, if at all, with the only actual improvement being the wider version with no spring. I then decided to compare this with what I considered the ideal valve, which is just a simple pipe section where the diameter gets reduced and the fluid is allowed to flow straight through its entire path. This showed a slightly better result with the fluid now reaching a new record output velocity of about 13.2 meters per second. The next step was to make the actual valve better. This is the design for the flow geometry I came up with. It has less room for dead zones with the fluid diverging off at a less aggressive angle and then also converging at a less aggressive angle. I tried to keep the cross-sectional area of the fluid's path as large as I could before it reached the nozzle section to prevent any unnecessary restriction on the fluid. This flow geometry showed a much better result with the outlet velocity now reaching around 13.9 meters per second. And this is without altering the inlet and outlet diameter, just the internal geometry. My next task was to see what else could be done to further improve outlet velocity. Remember what I said before about the reduction of nozzle diameter sometimes helping and sometimes hindering the outlet velocity? We can actually see this in my next set of simulations where I vary the nozzle diameter between 25% and 100% of the original. We can see our outlet velocity start to increase as we lower the nozzle diameter, but at a certain point it starts decreasing as the flow gets too constricted and the viscous effects take over. This gives us an optimal nozzle diameter of 75% of the original diameter, which in this case is about 1.33 millimeters. This configuration is estimated to allow a maximum outlet velocity of 16.2 meters per second, a performance improvement of 25.7%, and that's not nothing. This new exit velocity increases our range from just over 7 meters to almost 9 meters, and it'll be able to hit a target at meter diameter now over 5 meters away. Again, this is without air resistance, but regardless, the performance improvement just by changing the valve geometry is striking. It's hard to argue that this one at least helps somewhat in practice in the real world. Alas, an actual test of this geometry is outside the scope of this video, but I do intend to conduct one. So there you have it. Velocity. Look, here's the thing with fluid dynamics. Predicting the behavior of fluids is difficult, as gases and liquids are chaotic by nature. Their molecules are farther apart, they vibrate faster than solids, and can easily slip past one another. This is partly why there are so many abstractions, approximations, and assumptions when dealing with fluids. It's just the only way to understand it without delving into insanely complicated mathematics. I'm talking more complicated than I have ever encountered, and definitely more complicated than what is presented here. But one thing is for sure, if you want to build the best web shooter using fluid, you better be sure you understand how viscosity and pressure can affect the flow. Of course, web lines, after they've solidified, need to have certain properties in order to support something like swinging from buildings. But these properties, which we'll discuss next time, are much better described in a qualitative way, so don't worry, no math moving forward. Un unless you like the math, in which case, welcome to the club, nerd. On to the last key concept, the adhesive-cohesive balance. For those who are unaware, cohesion is a property of identical molecules that stick together very well, like with water or mercury. But adhesion is a tendency of dissimilar molecules to stick together. A balance between adhesion and cohesion is basically a fancy way of saying the web must be very strong and very sticky, but also in such a way that fits your individual needs. For instance, some people might want their web shooter to be used for grappling or forming web lines. Thus, adhesion would take a backseat and the cohesion of the web becomes more important. 
Now, others might want to shoot sticky goo that could trap their enemies. I mean, whatever you want, you know, whatever floats your boat. The supposed ideal here, if we're looking at something fantastical like web swinging, is that the web is both strong so it can support the weight of the user, and sticky so its attachment to any surface can support the weight of the user. However, even if this web line existed, it would adhere to the user's hand when they grab it as well, so they shouldn't plan on letting go of it unless they want to lose some skin. Now, of course, this could be solved by some sort of special glove that doesn't stick to the web line, but I mean, come on, that's a whole other issue. Luckily, web shooters can be used in more ways than just creating web lines to swing on, and that's where the adhesive-cohesive balance comes in. Me personally, I would like to create webs that can make movement difficult for a target as a sort of non-lethal self-defense weapon. I mean, think of the applications. But, but of course, swinging would be pretty great too. Generally, we can set the adhesiveness of the web line by changing the ingredients. Let's look at the basic web formula that I outlined in one of my videos, consisting of four ingredients. Isopropanol, polymethyl methacrylate, tetrafluoroethane, and polysorbate 80. For now, I'm going to abstract these ingredients as solvent, polymer, propellant, and surfactant, as they each have a very clear role to play. Now, I wanted to show that this formula could create a web line that, when shot, connects the web shooter nozzle to the target. It took a lot of trial and error with the ingredients to achieve this, but the first formula I found that worked was 38% solvent, 6% polymer, 37% propellant, and 19% surfactant. Now, while this did create a web line, it was clear that the line was not very cohesive. It easily broke after sufficient movement. So next, my desire was to increase the cohesion, which likely would sacrifice some adhesion, but hopefully not so much that the web no longer stuck to the wall. I modified my formula to increase the surfactant and decrease the solvent. I didn't want to alter any of the other ingredients as increasing the solid polymer would likely make the fluid too thick and decreasing the liquid propellant would likely do the same. So my next fluid recipe was 28.5% solvent, 6% polymer, 37% propellant, and 28.5% surfactant. I tested this web formula in this video and it was clear the web lines were slightly stronger. Having the same amount of solvent and surfactant seemed to balance adhesion and cohesion. But why is this? Well, a solvent is what makes the web fluid a fluid for the most part. While the propellant also has some absolutely necessary dissolving properties, it must act together with the solvent in order to fully dissolve the polymer. Now, polymers are difficult to dissolve, so finding a solvent for a particular polymer can be tricky. In this case, it just so happens that polymethyl methacrylate will dissolve nicely in isopropanol, and that solution dissolves nicely in tetrafluoroethane, even when the surfactant is added. So having less solvent means that the fluid will be more viscous, and more solvent means less viscous. A less viscous fluid will wet the target surface much more easily, which is an important property of adhesion. Wetting most obviously means that a liquid must be able to maintain contact with the substrate material. Most liquids can do this to most solids, but the opposite to this effect would be something like water interacting with hydrophobic material, where the cohesive forces within the water are much greater than any adhesive force between the water and the substrate. This can also be seen in nature, with water being unable to wet the surface of leaves. And there are more advantages that a less viscous solution can provide. Since none of the independent ingredients have any adhesive properties whatsoever, I propose that the main method of adhesion presented here is purely mechanical. That is to say the web fluid works its way into the small pores of the substrate in order to maintain a secure bond. As we've discussed earlier in our oh-so-fun fluid dynamics segment, a more viscous fluid will not be able to flow as easily through small pores. So we see why the solvent might affect the adhesive-cohesive balance, but what about the surfactant? So, a surfactant is a surface-active agent that is able to lower the surface tension of a substance. Think about soap in water. Now, ordinary water has a high surface tension, as can be seen if you completely fill a container with water. If you add soap, which contains surfactants, the surface tension is lowered, and we see the bulge of the water over the top can't reach the same height that it did before. Now, surface tension is the tendency of a liquid surface to shrink to the smallest surface area possible. It's why water beads become circular or spherical in zero gravity. If you try to blow bubbles with pure water, you'll be sorely disappointed. The geometry of a bubble means it contains very little volume, but has a lot of surface area. 
the surface tension will collapse the bubble into a solid sphere of the same volume, which is going to be very small. On the surface of water, any air bubble which rises to the top will be unstable. The walls are going to rejoin the water to maintain a flat surface, and the air will go back into the atmosphere. However, if you add soap, the surfactants will decrease the surface tension, and bubbles will become possible with their large surface areas and small volumes. Now, adding our surfactant to wet fluid means the same thing, that bubbles can form. Now, most likely, these bubbles mainly contain the expanded propellant gas. This allows our web fluid to expand to greater apparent volumes than it would otherwise appear, one way to potentially store a lot of web in a small container. These bubbles, however, increase the surface area of the web fluid, meaning the solvent can evaporate more quickly, leading to more solid, less adhesive, more cohesive webs. You can think analogously about how long it takes for a large, shallow puddle to evaporate versus a glass of water of the same volume. The puddle will be gone in no time, as the surface area, the area that is exposed to the environment which causes evaporation, and the area at which the vapor molecules must exit, is much larger. So the addition of expansion due to surfactants may cause the solvent to evaporate more quickly and the web to become less adhesive and more cohesive. The addition of excess solvent may cause the web fluid to stay liquid for longer and be able to seep into the pores of the target, becoming more adhesive and less cohesive. If we look at the history of my web fluid tests, we can see a large range of adhesive-cohesive balances, especially when I first started to observe the properties of this sort of mixture. For instance, in this test for my web fluid tutorial in 2017, I added a really small amount of surfactant, and when the web fluid was shot, it maintained its liquid state for a very long time, was extremely sticky, and was able to be shot rather quickly. In these tests, also from 2017, I added a really small amount of solvent with a higher amount of surfactant. Now this web fluid came out with larger expanded diameters, almost instantly solid, not sticky at all, and only oozed out slowly from the nozzle. In the end, it goes back to the two main uses of web shooters. If you want to catch objects in a web, you may want a more adhesive web fluid. If you want to be able to hang on your web line or swing through the city streets like a majestic spider man, then cohesion is your best friend. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What are we doing here? Web swinging? Are we serious? Okay, now, this is the not so fun downer ending of the video, but I'm gonna try turning it around, so just bear with me. So there's some major problems with the concept of web swinging, and we're gonna discuss them here. I hear a lot of people say that you'll tear your arm off if you were able to swing like Spider-Man, which, okay, maybe you will, but that's the problem you see with this? Really? I mean, first of all, storage. We talked about expansion due to gas bubbles increasing the apparent volume of the web beyond that of what the container could hold, but that doesn't even begin to cover what we see in fiction. From the Amazing Spider-Man movies, can I first say that I love these movies? We hear an Oscorp promotional video state, Engineered from genetically enhanced spiders, Oscorp's biocable tensile strength is unparalleled. We're just beginning to understand all the potential industrial applications. A single pellet can safely store several hundred meters of a lightweight cable. The pellet they're talking about is that little cartridge that Peter pushes into his tiny watch web shooters. In this movie, Peter's webs are actually spider silk, farmed by Oscorp and somehow placed into these small pellets. It's true that spider silk is lightweight in real life, in that its density, 1.097 grams per cubic centimeter, is very small compared to other typical heavy load cable materials like steel, or even many synthetic polymers. I mean, furthermore, its tensile strength is stronger than some steels, though not stronger than the strongest steels. The tensile strength of dragline silk from an orb weaving spider is around 1 gigapascal, essentially saying it can hold around 1 billion newtons if it had a cross-sectional area of 1 square meter, or 1,000 newtons if it had a cross-sectional area of 1 square millimeter. For reference to my fellow Americans, 1,000 newtons is about 225 pounds of force. It's a lot. So let's analyze for the bare minimum required storage space. Now let's say Pete weighs about the same as me, about 170 pounds. Yeah, I'm in shape. It makes sense, this is Andrew Garfield's Peter Parker. He's tall and skinny, just like me. A load of 170 pounds of force means that the minimum required cross-sectional area here would be about 0.756 square millimeters. 
Okay, just ignore that I'm mixing units here. Oscorp clearly runs on metric, so blame them. Now let's look at storing even just 100 meters, not the several hundred Oscorp claims to be possible. Let's look at 100,000 millimeters of rope with a cross-sectional area of 0.756 square millimeters. Now this rope has a volume of 75.6 thousand cubic millimeters, or 75.6 thousand microliters, or 75.6 milliliters. That's not a lot, it's about a third of a cup, but it's still more than the teaspoon size of cartridge we see Peter use in the movie. Okay, so maybe it's feasible, but remember we took the bare minimum here in terms of load for the rope, and that will never ever cut it. In engineering there's something called a safety factor. Usually for holding people we want the rope to be rated for a load of 10 times what we need, because there's no room for error when it comes to human life. Which means we need 10 times the cross-sectional area of the rope, i.e. 10 times the volume. But furthermore, not to burst anyone's bubble, but spider silk is not stronger than Kevlar. It's not. I'm sorry. At least, not in the tensile sense. It's true that the energy required to break spider silk at 400 kilojoules per kilogram is much higher than Kevlar's 30 kilojoules per kilogram. But this is a measure of toughness, of energy absorption. Important for the engineering of stuff like bulletproof vests. Not for hanging a static load on a tensile cable. While that is very impressive and mostly due to the amazing elasticity of spider silk, Kevlar's tensile strength is four times as high as spider silk's at four gigapascals. So we know that Kevlar is four times as strong as spider silk for our application. And take a look at this real demonstrable test of Kevlar. It's important to note here that I weigh about 170 pounds, and this rope is rated for 500 pounds. So yeah! Now the rope broke at the knot, so there's likely a concentration of stress there, but still. If you can't tie a rope around something without it breaking, I'd say that means it can't actually support the load. Now the diameter of this Kevlar line is 1.4 millimeters, meaning the cross-sectional area is about 1.53 square millimeters, so it stands to reason that the smaller area of 0.756 square millimeters for the weaker spider silk wouldn't come close. Now this Kevlar line rated for 2,000 pounds and having a diameter of 3.1 millimeters, so a cross-sectional area of about 7.55 square millimeters, can hold my weight quite securely. Now this safety factor is in theory 2,000 divided by 170, or about 11.8. To get this same safety factor for spider silk, you need to multiply the cross-sectional area of the Kevlar line by 4, or multiply the diameter by 2 to get 6.2 millimeters. Now, I'm not the best at eyeballing distances, but I'd say that could be larger than the web lines we see in The Amazing Spider-Man, depending on the scene. To estimate how much web fluid we'd need to store for 100 meters of this theoretical spider line, we can run the same process as before. The diameter is 6.2 millimeters, so the cross-sectional area is about 30.19 square millimeters. So 100 meters or 100,000 millimeters of this line would have a volume of around 3.019 liters, which is probably way too big to hold on your wrist, let alone anywhere else. Apart from the unrealistic volume storage, we see that there's another major problem that will need serious scientific advancements to solve. We've discussed the idea that an ideal web would be both very cohesive and very adhesive, so the end of the line could stick to a building and the line itself could hold the load. And we've already discussed that the web would not be able to discriminate between the user's hand and the building when creating an extremely strong bond. But one of the most glaring issues with this is that this type of bond doesn't really exist. Alan Pan from the channel Sufficiently Advanced did a great job demonstrating that even some of the strongest adhesives available cyanoacrylates are not strong enough to hold a person's weight when attached at the end of a rope. This led him to go straight to the grappling hook route, which I'd say is a wise move. Compounding this problem with all of the dirt and dust and condensation that surely covers the exterior of the New York City skyline makes it look really unlikely that a web line could hold even a moderate load to the side of a building. Now, of course, I want to urge people to never say never, 
current web shooter theories can't solve this problem, but maybe future ones can. For instance, we could somehow use real spider silk, and I want to stress the somehow here because nobody, no spider, nothing has ever shot spider silk in the way Spider-Man does. Silk is simply excreted or dispensed at slower velocities in nature. But anyway, spiders have different types of silk. Some are for attaching web lines at their ends and are really sticky, and some are for making really strong strands. So they have solved this problem. Or should I say the evolution of silk spinners has really given them some impressive skills. So if we could somehow achieve the incredible adhesion and strength of spider silk, we may have a shot. But these are some pretty big ifs. Now I won't go too much into real spider silk as I definitely have a plan to cover that super fascinating topic another day. And then you know there's the arm tear off thing, but as an athlete that never really concerned me, but I suppose it could happen. So yeah, web swinging probably won't be with fluid shooters anytime soon, which means these guys have the right idea. Now I'm going to take a crack at something like this too, I just have to find a way to make it my own so we can really start to advance this thing. I mean the idea of grappling hooks being easily retractable so you could swing and get your rope back while you're shooting the next line seems really exciting, but there's a lot of technical problems that need to be solved there. Grappling, believe it or not, at the end of these incredibly long videos is a topic for another day. But just look at the topics we covered here, I mean phase transitions, polymers, projectile motion, fluid dynamics, simulations, tensile strength, intermolecular forces, and that's just scratching the surface. In practice, making web shooters may involve solid mechanics, electronics, or even programming. I'd say setting out to make web shooters is a great way to learn all things science and engineering. And parents, if you're watching, I hope you can excuse some of my language, but if you want to get your kids started in STEM, maybe don't think your kids are crazy if they say they want to be Spider-Man. I hope you all enjoyed watching, and I hope you learned something. I'm continually fascinated by the topics I've covered here, as you can probably tell. I would consider this video to be a must watch for those who want to make web shooters. I mean, I, I can't think of a topic I didn't cover. If you have any gripes with any of my science or my claims in this video, please, please, please let me know in the comments below. I'm usually pretty good about responding. And in my attempts toward good science, I will not shake it off and pretend I was right all along. I will highlight any mistakes in the next video. And as always, please ask questions, especially to clarify any of the material I've covered. And don't forget to leave a like to motivate me to make the next one too. And follow me at the.amazing.labs on Instagram to see any updates. Check out my Patreon page, the link for which is in the description below. And feel free to contribute on there to get access to the STL files for my build videos. Also, you can buy my merch on my Spreadshirt shop, the link for which is in the description below. You can also find select items on my YouTube channel in the store tab. And let me just say, this is not even our best item. so. A quick reminder that the Patreon and the Spreadshirt shop both serve to support the creation of Dragline Dynamics, an independent laboratory where us inventors can begin to tackle the scientific problems I've outlined here, and maybe one day we'll be swinging with web fluid. Think Hacksmith Industries, but with more spider webs. Not like an abandoned Hacksmith Industries, but you get the idea. Also the link to my Discord server is down below. Feel free to join and discuss to your scientific heart's content. I also host a podcast on Spotify with a member of the Astrals. If you don't know what that is, just listen to the podcast. The link is in the description. Now, just because something is impossible doesn't mean it will always be. Now, stay safe, stay amazing, and I'll see you guys in the next one.